Amazing. How's everyone doing? Very good. Very, very good. So, my name is Stephen, and this is my wife, Hannah. And yeah, we're part of the pastor's team. I've been a part of this team for three years, but been a part of this church for many more than that, pretty much my whole life. Um, and it's incredible. It's an incredible time, you know, when, you, when you've been here for a long time, you kind of see how all the pieces move. And I want to say the team that we have at the moment is incredible. Oh, my props are coming up. The, the, the simplest of prop you can get, the humble green chair, the humble green chair, but the important green chair, um, because it is where we sit, where we receive the word. And I'm excited today. Um, it's been quite an exciting run of preachers. Um, we've, we've spoken about joy and we've spoken about hope. We spoke about healing in the evening service uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I want to say in the last like month, I think I've seen more healing than in the last 10 years. So if you are needing healing, then maybe things are happening at the moment. And we'll leave space for that afterwards. Um, but to start the service, I, wanna, I want everyone just to close their eyes now. Everyone. And just, just, just get some calm and some peace. And what I want you to picture now is heaven. And, and what I want you to do is fill it with all the, the cheesy and exciting things that you've heard about heaven. Maybe some of them are biblical, maybe some of them are not, maybe some of them are your imagination. You know, maybe you're there, and as you walk in, you get given a white robe, and it's flowy and it's beautiful. Maybe some of you get this halo. As you walk in, there's like a, a choir going, and the angels are singing. Maybe some of you think you're flying around like the angels. You're definitely seeing streets paved with gold, no doubt. You're seeing the massive mansion that the Lord has set for you. It's got an incredible patio. Maybe some of you have an ocean view. Maybe some of you have a view of the mountains. You've definitely got a bra there. The Holy Spirit music is still in the background. And it's, it just never ends. And it's beautiful. And then there's the throne room. And there's Jesus and God. And, and all these things are there. And your eyes still closed. Just, just keep that picture there. And what I want you to start to do is right now, re remove the mansion. Remove the ocean view or the mountain view. You don't have your white robe on or your halo. You've just got normal clothes. There's no streets. They're paved with gold. There are actually no streets at all. There's no angels flying around. You're not flying around. And all heaven is, is this white room, empty, except for two green humble chairs. And one is for you, and one is for Jesus. And you can open your eyes now. And I want to say that if the end of that picture disappointed you and you were really excited for the streets paved with gold and less excited about this scene right here, then maybe we've forgotten that the person sitting in the chair opposite us is the creator of all things, the Alpha and Omega, the healer, the provider, the infinite being, so mysterious and wonderful that we could sit in a room with him forever and never lose wonder, never get bored. And his presence should excite us more than anything else. And today, the title of my preach is Jesus is the Reward. And, and I'll, I'll expand on that and say the Godhead is the reward. The three in one, the Holy Spirit, Father and Son. But for ease's sake, I'm just going to say Jesus is the reward. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. And 
as Christians, we all have these like, some people call them throne room encounters, but these significant moments in our walk. And I want to talk about a moment in my walk that was quite significant. That wasn't a walk, it was actually a run. And I was on a run one day, and I, I, was, I was just finishing my trick, and I was running, and I was praying, and I was saying, um, Lord, life is great right now. I was just in one of those sweet spots, you know, playing great rugby, or at least I thought so. Um, you know, I was, I was popular, I was head boy, you know, when you're at head boy, you've got your own house, I don't know if you do that, you've got your own house, and you've got these great eights that are making you food, and I'm like, wow, you know, like, this is, this is pretty good, and I was basically like, Lord, yo, these rewards on earth are so good, eh? I'm paraphrasing, I didn't say it like that, but God started to challenge me on that run, and he started to say, said, Stephen, would you be okay if you weren't playing great rugby? And I'd be like, sure, that's far-fetched, Lord. <laughs> Sharon, you're going to help me with that, hey? And I said, yeah, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. As long as it's me and you, I'll be okay. And he said, Stephen, would you be okay if you didn't have all the girls after you? <laughs> And I said, actually, Lord, it'll be, it'll be a nice breathing room for me, you know. <laughs> I said, Lord, I just need one perfect wife, and he gave that to me. <laughs> good save. Good save, eh, John? And on this run, the Lord kept challenging me, and he said, Stephen, what happens if you don't have your health? What happens if you don't have your academic ability? And it, it like almost starts to get un more and more uncomfortable where I realized that I had said, Lord, I'd be okay if I stripped everything away. And I kept saying, yes, Lord, I'll be okay if it's just me and you. Yes, Lord, if you take that away, I'll be okay. And it got to a point where there was nothing left and just me and Jesus. And I was saying, yes, it'll still be okay. And in that moment, it was actually quite easy to say, I'll be okay. But <laughs> true as anything, the next season I went into, I went to varsity and I got very, very sick. And I couldn't play sports anymore. Because of it, I spent lots of time in hospital, and you know, it was really horrible and dark for me, and I started failing my degree, my girlfriend and I split up, it was just like, and things were unraveling, I was far away from home, far away from Hillside, it was like sheep, it was like, I really don't have anything except me and the Lord. And it was the most beautiful thing that in that moment, I could actually say, yes, I am still okay with just me and Jesus. And I want to say that like people have had throne room encounters and special moments in their spiritual walk, for me, that was so significant that I could truly say in that moment, if it was just me and Jesus, I'd be okay. And to double down on this analogy, when I was in Pretoria, I was a part of an incredible church here called 3CR, and one, the young adult pastors, they, um, I have a great respect for a guy called Jeff, and they had a baby girl, and she had Down syndrome. And so he took a bit of a sabbatical to process this, and he came back, and the first preach that he preached when he came back, it was, it was incredibly raw and real, and I, I really respect his um, openness to the congregation. But he said, if he's honest, getting that news was devastating. He said he realized then and there that he had to be a provider for this person all the way until the day they die, because they wouldn't be able to provide for themselves. It was a baby girl that, in the world's eyes, wouldn't be seen as beautiful and attractive. And he said it was the most intensely painful time. But he said the one beautiful moment that came from it is that in it all, he could answer this question with boldness and confidence to say, the Lord is still enough, even in that tragedy. And he said he realized it gave him the most insane boldness to say, it actually doesn't matter what's around me because me and God are still here. And it was so beautiful for me to realize that no matter what's happening, that I can put my faith in the Lord. And that is enough. And even as we've been talking about these cool things like hope and joy and healing and all these amazing things, tonight Wayne is preaching about love and God's love, is that I want to say that we are not hoping in anything else, we're not putting our joy in anything else like these guys have been preaching, but in the Lord. And today I want to say that Jesus is the reward. 
And often in, in my, my walk of faith, I think about two things. I think about heaven and the kingdom of heaven. I think that's so important. And I think about creation and how we were designed to be. And so, again, humor me in this. Can we all close our eyes once more? And this time, you're not in heaven, but you're in the garden. You're Adam or you're Eve. There's amazing greenery around you. Everything's just growing so well. You know, like if you have your garden at home and it's struggling, that's not it. There are trees and there's just almost every tree has these fruits on it and it is incredible. You have little deers and fawns walking up next to you and you're patting them on the head and, and all these incredible things. There's streams running through and rivers flowing. But what makes all of it good is that you are walking with God in the cool of the day. And it's not good because the day is cool or you're walking in amazing meadows, but it is good because you are walking with God in His presence. And you can open your eyes now, but we know with hindsight what happened in that garden is that we as mankind wanted something more than God. And when that happens, when we want more than God, we look for it in other places and we let sin enter, we let pride enter, and all of a sudden, when God is not enough, we see the fall. We see sin enter. We see a distraction from God. We put idols in our life. And we are not too dissimilar to Adam and Eve in that garden. Because so often we want a reward that is not God. And what I love about that creation story is that I've had a recent like vision of this is that the moment sin entered, God stretched out his plan to the cross, to this point where we could be reunited, reconnected in intimacy with God. I get the sense he didn't hesitate for a moment to set this plan up to put us back in connection with God. And the beauty of the cross is that restoration back to the presence of God. And I want to say, don't mishear me in this. God gives us incredible rewards. And if you follow biblical principles, you will see abundance in your life, no doubt. In every area of your life. But what God says in his word, we, we, maybe we've manipulated in our minds, maybe we haven't fully understood it, but the reward he gives us is almost always himself. And I'm going to read a few scriptures to prove that. I talk about the Godhead. God gives very abundantly of, him whole, of his whole self. In Luke 11 verse 10, we can go there. We're going to read a few scriptures. I'll give a moment. Don't check your WhatsApps. I know you guys. I know you. Caleb told me recently, some churches say no watches. Not allowed to watch. Maybe you shouldn't allow to watch or a phone or anything like that and bring in your Bible and your notebook. I need to listen to that, actually. I need to listen to that. Anyway, Luke 11, verse 10. I've used the scripture before, but it's such a good one. For everyone who asks, receives. And whoever seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And so already I can tell you now that when we read that scripture, we start placing things in our mind, like what are we seeking? You know, oh, I'm seeking that job or I'm seeking that relational connection. What door am I knocking on? You know, you've already pictured that, you know. Whenever you think of that scripture, you start picturing that. And now it goes on to the goodness of God. It says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, instead of a fish, gives him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, egg will give a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, 
know how to good give, good give, ah, good give good gifts. <laughs> how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And so immediately we can we can put aside that scripture in the view of you know what thing am I looking for? It's actually who am I looking for? Who am I asking for? What door am I knocking on? It's the door of the Holy Spirit, access to His presence. And that is what makes God a good father. And I've said that before. Again, we don't have to go there because we all know it. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So already we see a father who give, gives good gifts gives the Holy Spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You know, we're in this thing now of like, what is God giving us? He's giving of himself. You don't have to go there, but in Leviticus, it says, You shall not make idols for yourself or erect images or pillars, and you shall not set up figures of stone in your land and bow down to them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence. And, and reverence. I am the Lord. And later on it says, And I will be your God. What is he giving? He's giving his lordship. He's giving us of himself. And whenever... We seek for a, a reward outside of that. We stumble every time. And some people rebuttal this with saying, you know, God gives us the desires of our heart, and we love that scripture. And, but it needs to read in its fullness, which is from Psalm 37, verse 3. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and then he will give you the desires of your heart. And this whole thing of it's like, we need to be in the presence of God to be receiving good rewards. And my whole point of today is, we must not be looking at the hands of the Holy Spirit, but into his eyes. We should not be looking for what he gives us, but instead we must be looking to who he is. You know, we aren't praying for the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, but we should be praying for the Holy Spirit. When we're talking about joy and hope, we shouldn't be looking at this thing called hope or this thing called joy. We should look at the joy giver, the hope giver, the faith builder, the healer, the provider. We shouldn't be looking at healing or provision, but looking at the healer and the provider. And I'll be honest, I get stuck in this. I'm an accountant, so I, I kind of see things very practically and logically. Not a good thing sometimes when you're a Christian. <laughs> if you want to live in the flesh, then, then that's a good thing. But if we want to live in the spiritual, we should be seeing things in the spiritual. Our value that we find from Holy Spirit is not the things or the wisdom that He gives us, but it is Him alone. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to point towards Jesus. And the role of Jesus is to reconcile us with the Father. And the role of the Father we saw in the beginning, to walk in the cool of the day with Him. And you know, sometimes as, as preachers, you come up with these, these amazing preachers, right? and you think, wow, came up with such clever ways to say that, and oh, I'm sure they're going to get it. And then, and then when you read the scriptures more and more around what you're preaching on, you realize the word has already said it, and probably said it better than I could. Very humbling, but very good. And I want us to all turn to Matthew 6. And to give some context, this is the Sermon on the Mount. We've just had the Beatitudes. We had some passages about being salt and light. We had a great passage about the fulfillment of the law. We've got some practical things about murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, an eye for an eye, love your enemies. So we're getting a great sermon here. 
And we get to Matthew 6, which pretty much sums up everything I've been preaching on this morning. And it probably says it better than I can. And I want to make a point of something is that we always say that quiet time is so valuable and time in the Word is so valuable, but life gets busy and we've got other things to do, and so we miss that. And so I want everyone to get it out now, and we're all going to read it in quiet, the whole chapter. Maybe just as practice, because maybe we haven't done quiet time in years. Maybe, like me, we listen to a podcast, I mean, um, our Bible app on the way to work. But maybe we need to be still, and right now you have no excuses. I've removed them all. You're saying, this is, this is just time to read Matthew chapter 6. And I'm a slow reader, so I will read it. And then when I'm done, I'm sure everyone else will also be done. Okay. And actually, Brad, you can't read it. Can you come play keys, please? What a beautiful passage of Scripture. And if we go all the way to the end of that passage in verse 33, we get this like famous line which says, But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And that sentence starts with the but, which means we have to go back to understand what is happening in this passage of Scripture. And throughout of all these things, it says, basically, you can get your reward here on earth. If you pray and fast and, and you tell the world, then that's cool. You've got your reward. But if you do it like this, then your reward is waiting for you. And... and um, Bill Johnson says this thing, which I love. He, he says, you know, testimonies are to be shared to advance the kingdom. He says, but some things, some moments that I've experienced with God, I will not tell anyone because I'm waiting to share them with God in a moment like this. 
So if we go through from chapter 6, we see it says, Give to the needy. You know, when we tithe, it tells us how to tithe here. You know, it says, um, Do it in secret. Do not let your left, left hand know what your right hand is doing. In prayer, it says, Do not go on babbling in front of everyone in the streets. But pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you talk about fasting, it says, don't just be normal. Put the extra cologne on and look all good and preppy when you go to work. You don't want people to think you're suffering and get sympathy from them. We're going to fast soon. The point of our fasting is still with intimacy with God. It says, do not store up treasures in heaven. I mean, do not store up treasures here on earth. Yo, you guys, you can call me out sooner than that, guys. You rebuke the pastor when you misquote scripture, please. No one can serve two masters. Either you will love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. And then it says, do not worry. And I love that last little part. Because the first part talks about us that have either created idols in our life, you know, we've stored up treasures here on earth and these are our special things. We've created these idols, okay? And you think like, oh no, I'm, I'm not the idol type of guy. You know, I'm a very down-to-earth guy and I, I just love Jesus. Well, then it also calls out some people that love Jesus, but for the point of glorification within the church body. And you're like, oh, maybe I'm worshiping with my hands raised so the person next to me can see me. And maybe you don't fall into those first two categories, but you're really stressed about your finances. This last chapter here, well, this last few chapters, verses, says, do not worry. That is also a distraction from seeking first the kingdom of God. And, and the guys that are asked to bring up those, those chairs, you guys can bring them up now, thanks. We're going to go into a time of ministry and I want to say, maybe you haven't created things that are idols. Maybe you, I don't know, maybe you didn't pursue the, the fancy career that could get the fancy car. And you're like, I'm actually just a really simple guy and like earthly possessions are not my thing, you know. But maybe you, the, maybe you are that person. <laughs> maybe you have made idols out of things. Maybe you have looked for rewards outside of the Father's presence. Maybe you're that person that has been doing this church thing and doing it well. But there's something inside of you that says, if I didn't get the recognition, I, I probably wouldn't be doing it. And maybe your prayer life needs to shift into a quiet space. And maybe you're that third person that you say, I don't babble in the streets. When I fast, I look all chipper. I don't have this whole like thing about gaining earthly possessions. But maybe you're anxious. Maybe you're worried about tomorrow. Maybe you're worried about what's going to clothe me. What's going to satisfy me? Am I going to be able to pay rent? Am I going to be able to fulfill the goals? Guys, can we spread them out? Sorry, spread them out. And what I want to invite us up to do this morning is come and have a one-on-one. -on -one. Just you and God. And say, I'm not going to have my idols. I'm not going to have the recognition of the world. I'm not even going to have my anxiety this morning. You are reward enough. Thanks, guys. And so we're going to close the service now. And I'll give you a few options. If you want to leave and go socialize, then, then go outside. Don't even go to the foyer. Go outside, outside. Okay. If you are needing healing, the pastor's team will be on the sides, like side sides. Because we've seen healing and, and there's healing happening. But if you need to just spend some time reframing your view of heaven like this, then come and spend couple minutes here. Brad will be up there for a bit longer. 
we're not in a rush. I kept it nice and short for this moment. So let's all stand now as we activate things here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this morning we say you are the reward and you are enough. You are more than enough to satisfy the desires of my heart, the anxiety of my soul. You are enough. You are more than the stresses of my finances, of my marriage, of my school, of my studies, of my work. You are more than my pride. <laughs> you are more than my perverted view of heaven. And today we declare that you are enough. Let's just say that now. Lord, you are enough. You are my great reward. And Lord, because you put so much value on connection with you that you sent your one and only son if you valued it that much that you put your son on the cross this morning we will join you in valuing connection and we repent of the times where we have forgotten how valuable the cross is how valuable connection is with you Amen.